Chapter 20 When Abel Gay paid Valancy her first month's wages, which he did promptly, and bills reeking of the odor of tobacco and whiskey, Valancy went into Deerwood and spent every cent of it. She got a pretty green crepe dress with a girdle of crimson beads at a bargain sale, a pair of silk stockings to match, and a little crinkled hat with a crimson rose on it. She even bought a foolish little be ribboned and be laced nightgown. She passed the house on Elm Street twice. Valancy never thought of about it at home, but saw no one. No doubt her mother was sitting in the room this lovely June evening playing solitaire and cheating. Valancy knew that Mrs. Frederick always cheated. She never lost a game. Most of the people Valancy met looked at her seriously and passed her with a cool nod. Nobody stopped to speak with her. Valancy put on the green dress when she got home, then took it off again. She felt so miserably undressed in its low neck and short sleeves, and that low crimson girdle around her hips seemed positively indecent. She hung it up in the closet, feeling flatly that she had wasted her money. She would never have the courage to wear that dress. John Foster's arraignment of fear had no power to stiffen her against this. In this one thing, habit and custom were still all-powerful. Yet she sighed as she went down to meet Barney Snythe in her old snuff-brown silk. That green thing had been very becoming, and she had seen so much in one ashamed glance. Above it, her eyes had looked like odd brown jewels, and the girdle had given her flat figure an entirely different appearance. She wished she could have it have left it on, but there were some things John Foster did not know. Every Sunday evening, Valancy went to the little free Methodist church in the valley on the edge of Back Up, a spireless little gray building among the pines, with a few sunken graves and mossy gravestones in the small pal palling encircled gra grass brown square beside it. She liked the minister who preached there. He was so simple and sincere, an old man who lived in Port Lawrence and had come out to the lake in a little disappearing propeller boat to give free service to the people of the small stony farms back up the back of the hills, who would otherwise never have heard any gospel message. She liked the simple service and the fervent singing. She liked to sit by the open window and look out into the pine woods. The congregation was always small. The free Methodists were few in number, poor and generally illiterate. But Valancy loved those Sunday evenings. For the first time in her life, she liked going to church. The rumor reached Deerwood that she had turned free Methodist and sent Miss, Mrs. Frederick to bed for a day. But Valancy had not turned anything. She went into the church because she liked it and because, in some inexplicable way, it did her good. Old Mr. Towers believed exactly what it preached, and somehow it made a tremendous difference. Oddly enough, Warren Abel disapproved of her going to the Hill Church as strongly as Mrs. Frederick herself had done. He had no use for free Methodists. He was a Presbyterian. But Valancy went in spite of him. We'll hear something worse than that about her soon, Uncle Benjamin predicted gloomily. They did. Valancy could not explain, even to herself, just why she wanted to go to that party. It was a dance up back at Chudley Corners, and dancing at Chudley Corners were not, as a rule, the sort of assemblies where well-brought-up young ladies were found. Lancy knew it was coming off, for Roar and Abel had been engaged in, as one of the fiddlers. But the idea of going, there, going had never occurred to her until Roar and Abel broached it at supper. "'You come to the dance with me,' he ordered. "'It'll do you good. Put some color in your face. You look peaked. You want something to liven you up.' Valancy had found herself wanting to go. She knew nothing at all about what the dances at Chudley Corners were apt to be like. Her ideas of dances had been fashioned on the correct affairs that went, up, went by in the name of Deerwood in Port Lawrence. Of course, she knew the corner dances wouldn't be just like them, much more informal, of course, but so much more interesting. Why shouldn't she go? Sissy was in a week of apparent health and improvement. She wouldn't mind staying alone at the least. She entreated Valancy to go if she wanted to, and Valancy did want to go. She went to her room to dress. A rage against the stuffy brown silk seized her. Wear that to a party? Never. She pulled, pulled her green crepe from its hanger and put it on feverishly. It was nonsense to feel so, so naked just because her necks and arms were bare. But it was just her old maidishness. She would not be rid of it. On went the dress and the slippers. For the first time, it was the first time she had worn a pretty dress since the organies of her early teens, and they had never made her look like this. If only she had a necklace or something, she wouldn't feel so bare then. She ran out of the garden. There were clovers growing there, great crimson things growing in the long grass. 
Valancy gathered handfuls of them and strung them into a cord. Fastened above her neck, they gave her a comfortable sensation of a collar, and they were oddly becoming. Another circlet of them went around her hair, and dressed in the low puffs that became her. Excitement brought those faint pink stains to her cheek, and she, twist, she flung on a coat and pulled the twisty little hat over her head. "'You look so nice and, and different, dear,' said Sissy, "'like a green moonbeam with a gleam of red in it. "'If there could be such a thing,' Lancy stooped to kiss her. "'I don't feel right about leaving you alone, Sissy. "'Oh, I'll be all right. "'I feel better tonight than I have for a long while.' I've been feeling bad to see you sticking here so closely on my account. I hope you'll have a nice time. I was never at a party at the club corners, but I used to go sometimes, long ago, to dances back up. I always had good times. And you needn't be afraid of Father being drunk tonight. He never drinks when he engages to play for a party, but there may be liquor. What do you do if it gets roughed? Nobody would molest me. Not seriously, I suppose. Father would see to that. But it might be noisy and, and unpleasant. I won't mind. I'm only going as a looker-on. I don't expect to dance. I just want to see what a party backup is like. I've never been to anything except Deloria, Declorious Deerwood. Sissy smiled rather dubiously. She knew much better than Valancy what a party backup might be like if there should be liquor. But again, there mightn't be. I hope you'll enjoy it, she repeated. Valancy did enjoy the drive there. They went on early, for it was twenty miles to Chudley Corners, and they had to go in Abel's old raggedy top buggy. The road was rough and rocky like most Miss Coca wood roads, but it was full of austere charm of northern woods. It wound through beautiful, purring pines that were ranks of enchantment in the June sunset, and over the curious gray-green rivers of the Miss Coca, fringed by aspens abs that were always quivering with some supernatural joy. Roy and Abel was an ex excellent company, too. He knew all the stories and legends of the wild, beautiful back up, and he told them to Valancy as they drove along. Valancy had several fits of inward laughter over what Uncle Benjamin and Aunt Wellington at all would feel and think and say if they saw her driving with Roy and Abel's in that terrible buggy to the dance at Chudley Corners. At first, the dance was quiet enough, and Valancy was amused and entertained. She even danced twice herself with a couple of nice backup boys who danced beautifully and told her she did too. Another compliments came her way, not so subtle one, perhaps, but Valancy had too few compliments in her life to be over nice at that point. She ho overheard two of the backup young men talking about her in the dark lean to behind her. You know who that girl in green is? Nope. Guess she's from out front. The port, maybe. Got a stylish look to her. No beaut, but cute looking, I'd say. J ever seen such eyes? The big room was decorated with pine and fur bows and lighted by Chinese lanterns. The floor was waxed and Roaring Abel's fiddle, purring up under his skill touch, worked magic. The backup girls were pretty and prettily dressed. Valancy thought it was the nicest party she'd ever attended. By eleven o'clock, she changed her mind. A new crowd had arrived, a crowd unmistakably drunk. Whiskey began to circulate freely. Very soon, almost all the men were partly drunk. Those from the porch and outside around the door began howling, Come all ye's, and continued to howl them. The room grew noisy and reeking. Quarrels started here and there. Bad language and obscene songs were heard. The girls, swung rudely in dances, became sh disheveled and tawdry. Melancy, alone in her corner, was feeling disgusted and repentant. Why had she ever come to such a place? Freedom and independence were all very well, but one should not be a little fool. She might have known what it'd be like. She might have taken the warning from Sissy's guarded sentences. Her head was aching. She was feeling sick of the whole thing. But what could she do? She must stay on to the end. Abel could not leave it till then, and that would probably not be until three or four in the morning. The new influx of boys had left the girls far in minority, and the partners were scarce. Lancy was pestered with invitations to dance. She refused them all shortly, and some of her refusals were not well taken. There were muttered oaths and solemn looks. Across the room, she saw a group of strangers talking together and glancing meaningly at her. What were they plotting? It was at this moment that she saw Barney Snythe looking over the heads of the crowds at the door. Valancy had two distinct convictions. One, that she was quite safe now. 
The other was that this is why she had wanted to come to the dance. It had been such an absurd hope she could not recognize it before, but now she knew she'd come because of the possibility that Barney might be here too. She thought perhaps she ought to feel ashamed for this, but she wasn't. After her feeling of relief, her next feeling was one of annoyance with Barney for being coming there unshaven. Surely he might have enough for self-respect to groom himself up decently when he went to a party. There he was, bareheaded, bristly chinned, in his old trousers and his blue homespun shirt, not even a coat. Valencia could have shaken him in her anger. No wonder people believed anything bad of him. But she was not afraid any longer. One of the whispering groups left his comrades and came across the room to her, through the whirling couples now filled with, now filled it uncomfortably. He was tall, broad-shouldered fellow, not ill-addressed or ill-looking, but unmistakably half-drunk. He asked Valancy to dance. Valancy declined civilly. His face turned livid. He threw his arms around her and pulled her to him. His hot, whiskey breath burned in her face. "'We don't have any lady, fine lady airs here, my girl. If you ain't too good to come here, you ain't too good to dance with us. Me and my pal's been watching you. You got us to give us each a turn and a kiss to boot.' Valancy tried desperately and vainly to free herself. She was getting dragged out into the maze of shouting, stamping, and yelling dancers. The next moment, the man who held her went staggering across the room from a neatly pl planted blow to the jaw, knocking down whirling couples as he went. Valancy felt her arm grasp. This way, quick, Barney said Barney Snythe. He swung her out through the open window behind him, vaulted lightly over the sill, and caught her hand. Quick, we must run for it. They'll be after us. Valancy ran as she had never run before, clinging tightly to Barney's hand, wondering why she did not drop dead in such a mad scanter. Suppose she did. What a scandal it would make for her poor people. For the first time, Valancy felt a little sorry for them. Also, she felt glad she had escaped that horrible row. Also glad that she was holding tight to Barney's hand. Her feelings were badly mixed, and she had never had so many in such a brief time in her life. They finally reached a quiet corner in the pine woods. The pursuit had taken a different direction, and the whoops and yells behind them were growing faint. Valancy, out of breath, with a crazily beating heart, claps on the trunk of a fallen pine. "'Thanks!' she gasped. "'What a goose were you to come to such a place,' said Barney. "'I didn't know it would be like this,' protested Valancy. "'You should have known! Chudley Corners! It was just a name to me!' Valancy knew Barney would not realize how ignorant she was of the region's back up. She had lived in Deerwood all of her life, and of course she supposed he knew. He didn't know how she had been brought up. There was no use in trying to explain. When I drifted in at Abel's this evening, and Sissy told me you'd come up here, I was amazed and downright scared. Sissy told me she was worried about you, but didn't like to say anything to dissuade you for fear you'd think she was thinking selfishly about herself. So I came up here instead of going to Deerwood. Valancy felt a sudden, delight delightful glow, irradiating soul and body under the dark pines. So he had come up here to look after her. As soon as they stop hunting for us, we'll sneak around to the Muskoka Road. I left Lady Jane down there. I'll take you home. I suppose you've had enough of your party. Quite, said Valancy meekly. The first half of the way home, neither of them said anything. It would not have been much use. Lady Jane made so much noise they could not have heard each other. Anyway, Valancy did not feel conversation inclined. She was ashamed of the whole affair, ashamed of her folly and going, ashamed of being found in such a place by Barney Snythe. By Barney Snythe, reputed jailbreaker, infidel, forger, and defrauder. Valancy's lip twitched in darkness as she thought of it. But she was ashamed. And yet she was enjoying herself, was full of strange exultations, bumping over the rough road beside Barney Snythe, the big trees shot by them. The tall mullions stood up along the roads in stiff, orderly ranks like a com company of soldiers. The thistle looked like drunken fairies or tipsy elves as their car lights passed over them. This was the first time she'd ever been in a car. After all, she liked it. She was not in the least afraid with Barney at the wheel. Her spirits rose rapidly as they tore along. She ceased to feel ashamed. She ceased to feel anything except she was part of a comet rushing gloriously through the night of space. All at once, just where the pine woods frayed out to the scrub barrens, Lady Jane became quiet. Too quiet. Lady Jane slowed down quietly and stopped. Barney uttered an aghast exclamation, got out, investigated, came ap apologetically back. I'm a doddering idiot, 
out of gas. I knew it was short when I left home, but I meant to fill up in Deerwood. Then I forgot about it in all my hurry to get to the corners. What can we do? asked Flancy coolly. I don't know. There's no glass and gas nearer than near Deerwood, nine miles away. And I don't dare leave you here alone. There's always tramps in this road. And some of these crazy fools back at the corners may come straggling along presently. There were boys there from the port. As far as I can see, the best thing for us to do is just to sit patiently here until some car comes along and lends us enough gas to get to Roy and Abel's with. Well, what's the matter with that? said Valancey. We may have to sit here all night, said Barney. I don't mind, said Valancey. Barney gave a short laugh. If you don't, I needn't. I haven't any reputation to lose. Nor I, said Valancey comfortably. Chapter 21 We'll just sit here, said Barney, and if we think of anything worthwhile saying, we'll say it. Otherwise not. Don't imagine you're bound to talk to me. John Foster says, quoted Valancey, if you can sit in silence with a person for half an hour and yet be entirely comfortable, you and that person can be friends. If you cannot, friends you will never be, and you need not waste any time in trying. Evidently, John Foster has a sensible thing to say once in a while, conceded Barney. They sat in silence for a long while. Little rabbits hopped across the road. Once or twice, an owl laughed out delightfully. The road beyond them was fringed with the woven shadow lace of trees. Away from the southwest, the sky was full of silvery little cirrus clouds above the spot where Barney's Island must be. Valancy was perfectly happy. Some things dawn on you slowly. Some things come light by f lightning flashes. Valancy had a lightning flash. She knew quite well that she loved Barney. Yesterday, she had been all on her own. Now she was this man's. Yet he never done nothing, said nothing. He had not even looked at her as a woman, but that did not matter. Nor did it matter what he was or what he had done. She loved him without any reservations. Everything in, in her went out wholly to him. She had no wish to stifle or disown her love. She seemed to be his so absolutely that the thought apart from him, thought in which he was not predominant, was an impossibility. She had realized, quite simply and fully, that she loved him in the moment he was leaning on the car door, explaining that Lady Jane had no gas. She had looked deep into his eyes in the moonlight and known, in just that infinitesimal space of time, everything changed. Old things passed away, and all things became new. She was no longer unimportant little old maid Valancy Sterling. She was a woman, full of love, and therefore rich and significant, justified to herself. Life was no longer empty and futile, and death could cheat her of nothing. Love had cast out her last fear. Love! What a searing, torturing, intolerably sweet thing it was, this possession of body, soul, and mind, with something as at its core as fine and remote and as purely spiritual as the tiny spark, blue spark at her heart and the unbreakable diamond. No dream had ever been like this. She was no longer solitary. She was one of a vast sisterhood, all of women who had ever loved in the world. Barney need never know, though she would not in the least have minded his knowing. But she knew it, and it made a tremendous difference to her. Just to love. She did not ask to be loved. It was rapturous enough just to sit there beside him in silence, alone in the summer night in the white splendor of the moonshine, with the wind blowing down on them from the pine woods. She had always envied the wind, so free flowing where it listed, through the hills, over the lakes, with a tang, what a zip it had, what the magic of adventure. Valancy felt she had exchanged her shop-worn soul for a fresh, new one, fire new from the workshop of the gods. As far back as she could look, life had been dull, colorless, savorless. Now she had come to a little patch of violets, purple and fragrant, hers for the plucking. No matter who or what had been, in Barney's past, no matter who or what had been his future, no one else could have had this perfect hour. She surrendered herself utterly to the charm of the moment. Ever dream of ballooning? said Barney suddenly. No, said Valancy. I do, often. Dream of sailing through the clouds, seeing the glories of sunsets, spending hours in the midst of a terrifying storm with lightning playing above and below you, skimming above the silver cloud floor under a full moon. Wonderful. It does sound so, said Valancy. I've stayed on earth in my dreams. She told him about her blue castle. It was so easy to tell party things. 
One felt he understood everything, even the things you didn't tell him. And then she told him a little of her existence before she came to Roaring Abel's. She wanted to see why she had gone to dance up back. You see, I've never really had any life, she said. I've just breathed. Every door has always been shut to me. But you're still young, said Barney. Oh, I know. Yes, I'm still young. But that's so different from young, said Valancey bitterly. For a moment she was tempted to tell Barney why her years had nothing to do with her future, but she did not. She was not going to think of death tonight. I was never really young, she went on. Until tonight, she added in her heart. I've never had a life like other girls, and you wouldn't understand. Why, she had a desperate desire that Barney should know the worst about her. I didn't even love my own mother. Isn't that awful that I don't love my mother? Rather awful, for her, said Barney dryly. Oh, she doesn't know it. She took my love for granted. And I wasn't any use or comfort to her or anybody. I was just a, a, a vegetable. And I got tired of it. And that's why I came to keep house for Mr. Gay and look after Sissy. And I suppose people thought you'd gone mad. They did. And do, literally, said Vance Lancy. But it's comfort to them. They'd rather believe I'm me mad than bad. And there's no other alternative. But I have been living since I came to Mr. Gay's. It's been a delightful experience, and I suppose I had to pay back for it when I go back. But I've had had it. That's true, said Barney. And if you buy your experience, it's your own. But no matter how much you pay for it, somebody else's experience can never be yours. Well, it's a funny old world. Do you really think it's old? asked Valancey dreamily. I never believed that in June. It seems so young tonight somehow. That quivering moonlight like a young white girl waiting. Moonlight here is always on the verge of backup. is different from moonlight everywhere else, agreed Barney. It always makes me feel so clean somehow. Body and soul. And of course, the age of gold always comes back in the spring. It was ten o'clock now. The dragon of black cloud ate up the moon. The spring air grew chill. Valancey shivered. Barney reached into the innards of Lady Jane and clawed up an old tobacco-scented overcoat. Put that on, he ordered. Don't you want it yourself, protested Valancey. No, I'm not going to have you catching cold on my hands. Oh, I won't catch cold. I haven't had a cold since I came to Mr. Gay's, though I've done some foolish things. It's funny, too. I used to have them all the time. I feel so selfish taking your coat. You sneeze three times. No no use winding up your experience back up with gripe or pneumonia. He pulled it tight about her throat and buttoned it on her. Valancey submitted with secret delight. How nice it was to have someone look after you. She snuggled down into the tobacco-y folds and wished that tonight that night could last forever. Ten minutes later, a car swooped down from the back up. Barney sprang from Lady Jane and waved his hand. The car came to a stop beside them. Blanche saw Uncle Wellington and Olive staring at her in horror from it. Uncle Wellington had got a car. He must have been spending the evening up at Mistowa's with Cousin Herbert. Blanche almost laughed out loud at the expression on his face as he recognized her, the pompous, bewhiskered old humbug. Can you let me have enough glass gas to get to Deerwood? Barney asked him promptly. But Uncle Wellington was not attending to him. Valancey, how came you here? He said sternly. By chance or God's grace, said Valancey. With this jailbird! At ten o'clock at night! Said Uncle Wellington. Valancey turned to Barney. The moon had escaped from its dragon, and its light in her eyes was full of deviltry. Are you a jailbird? Does it matter? Asked Barney, gleam of fun in his eyes. Not to me. I only asked out of curiosity, continued Valancey. Then I won't tell you. I never satisfy curiosity. He turned to Uncle Wellington. His voice changed suddenly. Mr. Sterling, I asked if you could let me borrow some gas. If you can, all well and good. If not, you are only delaying you unnecessarily. Uncle Wellington was in a hor horrible dilemma. To give gas to this shameless pair, but not to give it to him. To go away and leave them there in the Mistowa woods until daylight, likely. It was better to give it to them and let them out of sight, get them out of sight before anyone else saw them. Got anything to get gas in? He grunted surlily. Barney produced a two-gallon measure from Lady Jane. The two men went to the rear of the Sterling car and began manipulating the tap. 
Delancey stole sly glances at Olive and over at the collar of Barney's coat. Olive was sitting grimly, staring straight ahead with an outraged expression. She did not mean to take any notice of Delancey. Olive had her own secret reasons for feeling outraged. Cecil had been in Deerwood lately, and of course, he'd heard all about Delancey. He agreed that her mind was changed, and was exceedingly anxious to find out once the derangement had been inherited. It was a serious thing to have in one's family. A very serious thing. One had to think of one's own descendants. She got it from the Waynesboroughs, said Olive positively. There's nothing like that in the Sterlings. Nothing! Oh, I hope not. I certainly hope not, Cecil had responded dubiously. But then, to go out as a servant, for that's what it practically amounts to. Your cousin! Poor Olive felt the implication. The Port Lawrence's prices were not accustomed to ally themselves with the families who members worked out. Lancy could not resist the temptation. She leaned forward. Olive, does it hurt? Olive bit stiffly. Does what hurt? Looking like that. For the moment, Olive's resolve would... She would take no further notice of Valancey. Then duty came uppermost. She must not miss the opportunity. Doss, she implored, leaning forward. Won't you come home? Come home tonight! Valancey yawned. You sound like a revival meeting, she said. You really do. If you come back, all will be forgiven. Yes, Olive said eagerly. Would it be splendid if she could induce the prodigal daughter to return? We'll never cast it upon you. Doss, there are nights when I cannot think, sleep for thinking of you. And me having the time of my life, said Valancey, laughing. Doss, I can't believe you're bad. You've always, you've always, I've always said you couldn't be bad. I don't believe I can be, said Valancey. I'm afraid I'm hopelessly proper. I've been sitting here for three hours with Barney's night, and he hasn't even tried to kiss me. I wouldn't mind it if he had, Olive. Valancey was was still leaning forward, her little hat with its crimson rose tilted down over one eye. Valancey smiled. What had happened to Valancey? She looked not pretty. Doss couldn't be pretty, but provocative. Fascinating, yes, indomitably so. Olive drew back. It must be beneath her dignity to say more. After all, Valancey must be both mad and bad. That's enough, thanks said Barney, behind the car. Much obliged, Mr. Sterling. Two gallons, seventy cents. Thank you. Uncle Wellington climbed foolish and feebly into his car. He wanted to give Snipe the piece of his mind, but dare not. Who knew what the creature might do if provoked? No doubt he carried firearms. Uncle Wellington looked indecisively at Valancey, but Valancey turned her back on him and was watching Barney pour gas into Lady Jane's maw. Drive on! said Olive decisively. There's no use in waiting here. Let me tell you what she said to me. That little hussy, that shameless little hussy, said Uncle Wellington. Chapter 22. The next thing the Sterling heard was a Valancey that was seen with Barney Snipe at the movie theater in Ponce Lawrence, and after that, a supper in a Chinese restaurant. This was quite true, and no one was more surprised at it than Valancey herself. Barney had come along in Lady Jane one tw dim twilight and told Valancey unceremoniously if she wanted to drive to hop in. I'm going to the port. Will you go, go there with me? His eyes were teasing and there was a bit of defiance in his voice. Valancey, who had not concealed herself from herself that she would have gone with him to any place, hopped in without more ado. They tore into and through Deerwood. Mrs. Frederick and Cousin Stickles taking a little air on the veranda, saw them whirl by in a cloud of dust and sought comfort in each other's eyes. Valancey, who had some dim pre-existence, pre had been afraid of a car, a car, was hatless and her hair was blowing wildly around her face. She was certainly come down with bronchitis and died Warren Abel's. She wore a low neck dress and her arms were bare. That snithe creature was in short sleeves, smoking a pipe. They were going at a rate of forty miles an hour. Sixty, Cousin Stickles averred. Lady Jane would hit a pike as when she wanted to. Valancey waved her hand gaily to her relatives. As for Mrs. Frederick, she was wishing she knew how to go into hysterics. Was it for this, she demanded in hollow tones, that I suffered the pangs of motherhood? I will not believe, said Cousin Stickles solemnly, that our prayers will not yet be answered. Who? "'Who will protect an unfortunate girl when I am gone?' moaned Mrs. Frederick. As for Valancey, she wondered if she could really be only a few weeks since she had sat there with them on that veranda. 
hating that rubber plant, pestering with teasing questions like black flies, or always thinking of appearances, cowed because of Mrs. Because of Aunt Wellington's teaspoons and Uncle Benjamin's money, poverty stricken, afraid of everything, envying Olive, a slave to moth eaten traditions, nothing to hope for or expect. Now every day was a gay adventure. Lady Jane flew over the fifteen miles between Deerwood and the port, through the port. The way Barney had went past traffic policemen was not holy. The lights were beginning to twinkle out of the stars in the clear lemon hued twilight. This was the only time Valancy ever really liked the town, and she was crazy with delight of speeding. Was it possible she'd ever been afraid of a car? She was perfectly happy riding beside Barney. Not that she deluded herself into thinking that it had any significance. She knew quite well that Barney had asked her to go on the impulse of the moment, an impulse born of a feeling of pity for her and of her starved little dreams. She was looking tired after a wakeful night with a heart attack, feeling followed by a busy day. She had so little fun. He had given her an outing for once. Besides, Abel was in the kitchen, at the point of drunkenness, where he is declaring he did not believe in God, and beginning to sing rabid songs. And while she would be out of the way for a while, Barney knew Roaring Abel's repertoire. They went to the movie. Blancy had never been to the movie. And then, feeling a nice hunger upon them, they went and had fried chicken, unbelievably delicious, in a Chinese restaurant. After which, they rattled home again, leaving a devastated trail of scandal after them. Mrs. Frederick gave up going to church altogether. She could not endure her friend's pitying glances and questions, but Cousin Snickles went every Sunday. She said they had been given a cross to bear. Chapter 23 On one of Sissy's wakeful nights, she told Valancy her poor little story. They were sitting by the open window. Sissy could not get her breath lying down that night, and an inglorious gibbous moon was hanging over the wooded hills, and the and spectral light, Sissy looked frail and lovely and incredibly young. A child. It did not seem possible that she could have lived through the passion and pain and shame of her story. He was stopping at the hotel across the lake. He used to come over in his canoe at night. We met in the pines down the shore. He was a young college student. His father was a rich man in Toronto. Oh, Valancy, I didn't mean to be bad. I didn't, indeed. But I loved him so. I love him yet. I'll always love him. I, and I, I didn't know some things. I didn't understand. And then his father came and took him away. And after a little, I found out. Oh, Valancy, I was so frightened. I didn't know what to do. I wrote him and he came. He said he would marry me, Valancy. And why... And why, oh, Valancy, he didn't love me any more. I saw that at a glance. He was just offering to marry me because he thought he ought to, because he was sorry for me. He wasn't bad, but he was so young. And what was I should he that he keep on loving me? Never mind making excuses for him, said Valancy a bit shortly. So why didn't you marry him? I couldn't. Not when he didn't love me any more. Somehow, I, I can't explain it. It seemed a worse thing to do than the other. He he argued a little, but he went anyway. Do you think I did right, Valancy? Yes, I do. You did do right, but he... Don't blame him, dear. Please don't. Let's not talk about him at all. There's no need to. I just wanted to tell you how it was. I didn't want you to think me bad. I never did think so. Yes, I felt that. Whenever you came, oh, Valancy, what you've been to me, I can tell you, but God will bless you for it. I know he will. With what measure ye meet? Sissy sobbed for a few minutes in Valancy's arms and wiped her eyes. Well, it's almost all. I came home. I wasn't really so very unhappy. I suppose I should have been, but I wasn't. Father wasn't hard on me, and the baby was so sweet, Valancy, with such little, little lovely blue eyes, and little rings of pale gold like silk floss, and tiny dimpled hands. He used to bite his satin smooth little face all over, softly so as not to hurt him, you know. I know, said Valancy, wincing. I, I know. A woman always knows, and dreams. And he was all mine. Nobody else had any claim on him. When he died, oh, Valancy, I thought I must die too. I didn't see how anybody could do her such an anguish and live. And to see his little dear eyes, and to know he would never open them again. To miss his warm little body nested against mine all night, and to think of him sleeping cold and alone in his wee face under the hard frozen earth. It was so awful for the first year. 
After that, it was a little easier. One didn't keep thinking. This day last year. But I was so glad when I found out I was dying. Who could endure a life if not for hope of death? Murmured Valancey softly, for it was a close course, a quotation from some book of John Foster's. I'm glad I've told you all of it, sighed Sissy. I wanted you to know. Sissy died a few nights after that. Warren Abel was away. When Valancey saw the change had come over Sissy's face, she wanted to telephone for a doctor, but Sissy wouldn't let her. Valancey, why should you? He can do nothing for me. I've known for several days that th this was near. Let me die in peace, dear. Just hold my hand. Oh, I'm so glad you're here. Tell father goodbye for me. He's always been as good as he knew how. And Bar Barney? Somehow I think that Barney... <laughs> But a spasm of cough interrupted and exhausted her. She fell asleep when it was over, still holding to Valancey's hand. Valancey sat in the silence. She was not frightened, or even sorry. At sunrise, as he died, she opened her eyes and looked past Valancey at something, something that made her smile suddenly and happily, and smiling, she died. Valancey crossed his sissy hands across her chest and went to the open window. On the eastern sky, amid the fire's sunrise, the old mood was... An old moon was hanging, as slender and as lovely as a new moon. Valancey had never seen an old, old moon before. She watched it pale and fade until it paled and faded out of sight in the living rose of day. A little pool in the barren shone in the sunrise like a great golden lily. But the world suddenly seemed a cooler place to Valancey. Again, nobody needed her. She was not in the least sorry Cecilia was dead. She was only sorry for all her suffering in life, but nobody could ever hurt her again. Valencia always thought death dreadful, but Sissy had died so quietly, so pleasantly, and at the very last, something had made it up to her for everything. She was lying there now, in her white sleep, looking like a child, beautiful, all the lines of shame and pain gone. Roy and Abel drove in, justifying his name. Valencia went down and told him. The shock sobered him at once. He slumped down on the seat of his buggy, his great head hanging. Sissy dead. Sissy dead, he said vacantly. I didn't think it would come so soon. Dead. She used to run down the lane to meet me with a pretty white rose stuck in her hair. Sissy used to be a pretty little girl, and a good little girl. She's always been a good little girl, said Valancey. Chapter 24 Valancey made Sissy ready for burial. Nobody, no hands but hers should touch that pitiful, wasted little body. The old house was spotless on the day of the burial. Barney Snyth was not there. He'd done all he could to help Valancey before it. he shrouded the pale Cecilia in white roses from the garden, and then had gone back to his island. But everybody else was there. All Deerwood and back up came. They forgave Sissy splendidly at last. Mr. Bradley had given a very beautiful funeral dress. Valancey had wanted her old Freemason man, but Roaring Abel was obdurate. He was a Methodist. He was a Presbyterian, and no one but a Presbyterian would bury his daughter. Mr. Bradley was very tactful. He avoided all dubious points, and was plain to be seen he hoped for the best. Six reputable citizens of Deerwood bore Sissy Gay to her grave in the Dolorous, decorous Deerwood Cemetery. Among them was Uncle Wellington. The Sterlings had come to the funeral, men and women. They had had a family conclave over it. Surely now that Sissy Gay was dead, Valancey would come home. She simply could not stay there with Roy and Abel. That being the case, the wisest course to greet Uncle James was to attend the funeral, legitimize the whole thing, so to speak, show Deerwood that Valancey really had done the most credible deed in going to nurse poor Sissy Gay, and that her family backed her up in it. Death, the miracle worker, suddenly made the thing quite respectable. If Valancey could return home and decently... While public opinion was still under the influence, all might be well. Society was suddenly forgetting all Cecilia's wicked doings and remembering what a pretty modest little thing she had been. And motherless, you know, motherless! It was the psychological moment, said Uncle James. So the Serlings went to the funeral. Even Cousin Gladys's neuritis allowed her to come. Cousin Stickles was there, her bonnet dripping over her face, crying as woefully as if Sissy had been her nearest and dearest. Funerals always brought Stickle, Cousin Stickles' own sad bereavement back. And Uncle Wellington was a pallbearer. Valancey, pale, subdued-looking, her slanted eyes smudged with purple, and her 
snuff brown dress, moving quietly, finding seats for people, consulting in undertones with minister and undertaker, marshalling the mourners into the parlor, was so decorous and proper and sterlingish that her family took heart of grace. This was not, could not be, the girl that had sat all night in the woods with Barney Snythe, who had gone tearing bareheaded through Deerwood and Port Lawrence. This was the Valancey they knew. Really, surprisingly capable and efficient. Perhaps they had always been kept down a bit too much. Amelia was rather strict, and hadn't had a sh chance to show what was in her. So thought the Sterlings. And Edward Beck, from Port Road, a widower with a large family who was beginning to take notice, took notice of Valancey and thought she might make a, f a mighty fine second wife. No beauty, but a fifty-year-old widower, Mr. Beck told himself reasonably, couldn't expect everything. Altogether, it seemed that Valancey's matrimonial chances were never so bright as they were at Ce Ce Cecilia Gay's funeral. What the Sterlings and Edward Beck would have thought when they had known the back of Valancey's mind must be left to the imagination. Valancey was hating the funeral, hating the people who came to stare with curiosity at Cecilia Marble's white face, hating the smugness, hating the dragging, melancholy singing, hating Mr. Bradley's cautious platitudes. If she had had her own absurd way, there would have been no funeral at all. She would have covered Sissy over with flowers and shut her away from prying eyes and buried her beside the nameless baby in the grassy burying ground under the pines of the back-up church with a kindly prayer from the old free Methodist minister. She remembered Sissy say once, I wish I should bury deep in the heart of the woods, where nobody would ever come to say, Sissy Gay is buried here, and tell my miserable story. But this! However, it would be over soon, Clancy knew. The Sterlings and Edward Beck didn't, exactly what she intended to do then. She laid awake all night, all the preceding night thinking about it and deciding on it. When the funeral procession had left the house, Mrs. Frederick sought out Clancy in the kitchen. My child, she said tremulously, you'll come home now? Home, said Valancey absently. She was putting on an apron and calculating how much tea she must put on to steep for supper. There would be several guests from back up, distant relatives of the gays who would not remember them for years. She was so tired she wished she could borrow a pair of legs from the cat. Yes, home, said Mrs. Frederick with a touch of a asperity. I suppose you won't dream of staying here now, alone with Roaring Abel. Oh, no, I'm not going to stay here, said Valancey. Of course... I'll have to stay a day or two to put the house in order generally, but it will be all right. Excuse me, mother, won't you? I've a frightening lot to do with all these backup people coming here for supper. Mrs. Frederick retreated in considerable relief, and the Sterlings went home with lighter hearts. We'll just treat her as if nothing happened when she comes back, decreed Uncle Benjamin. That will be the best plan, just as if nothing happened.